everybody. So today we are going to be starting chapter 15 on carbohydrates. And we're actually going to break this up into two parts. But overall in this chapter, we are going to learn how to classify monosaccharides as either an aldose or a ketose and indicate the number of carbon atoms that are in that sugar. We'll also identify chiral and achiral carbons um, within an organic molecule, how to use Fischer projections to identify D and L in antiomers, how to draw those Fischer projections, how to identify Haworth structures of monosaccharides, and then identify the products of oxidation reduction reactions for sugars, and determine whether or not a carbohydrate is a reducing sugar or not. We'll also learn how to describe the monosaccharide units and linkages in disaccharides and polysaccharides, as well as describe the structural features of sort of the major biologically relevant polysaccharides of amylose, amylopectin, glycogen, and cellulose. So again, we're breaking this chapter up into two parts. In part one, we are going to be focusing on the types of carbohydrates and exploring chirality through our first four learning outcomes that I just described in the previous slide. So first off, what are carbohydrates? Most of us are very familiar with carbohydrates in terms of diet. Often they get a bad rap, right? We always talk about low carb diets, but carbohydrates are the major source of energy from our diet. So we can't cut out carbohydrates altogether, right? Carbohydrates are important and our cells are designed to store um, energy as the polymer carbohydrate glycogen. So when we eat carbohydrates, we can break those down into monosaccharide units, um, either from simple sugars um, or more complex sugars. We break them down into their monosaccharide units, and then we can store them in our body, in our muscle cells, in our liver as glycogen. Um, when we need sugar, we can break glycogen down into glucose, into our bloodstream, which then can circulate through our blood to the cells that need and can take up that glucose and then undergo glycolysis in order to make ATP. Again, that's something you're going to talk more about in your um, uh, metabolism classes, um, and we may get to touch on glycolysis a little bit at the end of this semester just sort of depending on how quickly we move through this material. Okay, um, so again it's the major source of energy in her diet. It's how we store energy long term um, and regardless of what kind of diet you want to adhere to or prescribe to your clients, ultimately it's going to come to calories in versus calories out, regardless of our food source. If we eat too many carbohydrates, then the excess carbohydrates, once we have satisfied our glycogen stores, are still going to get converted to fat. If we eat excess protein, right? Yes, we can break protein down and convert it to glucose and then make it into glycogen. But again, if our glycogen stores are met and we haven't burned any calories, then all of those excess calories are still going to get converted to fat and stored as fat. And then, of course, if we eat a high fat diet, like such as the keto diet, then again, excess calories is going to get stored as fat. So really, we want to make sure that our clients and our patients are eating a balanced diet that is calorie focused, right, that our clients are getting good exercise and good nutrition in a balanced calorie focused diet. Anyway, let's get back to carbohydrates. So yes, they're the major source of energy in our diet. Um, they are going to be made from the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen also typically called saccharides, which means sugars, right? And so you may recognize a lot of these, right? Glucose, fructose, galactose, these are all what we consider monosaccharides. Um, we also have disaccharides, which have two sugar units, such as sucrose, maltose, and lactose. Oligosaccharides are sort of our medium range carbohydrates. Um, raffinose and stachyose are common ones that you may have heard of. And then polysaccharides are our more complex sugars. Um, they are more than 10 sugar units. Um, and so the examples of that are starch, 
which is made of amulose and amulopectin and glycogen. We will revisit these later. Um, and then um, fibers, um, fibrous materials are often also sugars. Um, so pectin, beta-glucan, cellulose, right? These are all um, fibrous carbohydrates that you may have recognized from other courses or discussions. So again, basically we can categorize car carbohydrates in three major categories. Monosaccharides, which are the simplest of carbohydrates. Those are just one sugar units. Disaccharides are where you have two monosaccharides that come together um, through what you will learn is a glycosidic bond. Um, and then polysaccharides will contain many monosaccharides linked together in a glycosidic bond. And polysaccharides can either be linear in this chain, but we can also get branching. And again, we'll explore that later in part two of this lecture. So let's focus on monosaccharides. Um, monosaccharides are our basic building block of this biopolymer, um, and it contains, uh, every monosaccharide contains several hydroxyl groups attached to a chain of a minimum three to around eight carbon atoms. You can have some monosaccharides longer than that, but that's going to be your average. Um, and it's also going to contain either an aldehyde or a ketone. So we're going to have a carbonyl group on one of those carbons either at the end. If it's at the end, then we remember from our last unit that is an aldehyde. So if we have a monosaccharide that happens to have an aldehyde functional group, we would classify that as an aldose. If our carbonyl is a ketone, in the middle of the monosaccharide, then we call that a ketose. And then if you notice, we also have hydroxyl groups on all of the other carbons except for the carbonyl carbon, right? So hydroxyl, 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 okay? Monosaccharides are often classified by their number of carbon atoms present. So a triose, has three carbons. Tetrose has four, pentose five, and hexose six. Um, we can also further identify uh, a monosaccharide as identifying whether it's an aldose or a ketose. So for example, an aldopentose is a five carbon saccharide with an aldehyde group, right? So the carbonyl at the end, whereas a ketohexose is a six carbon saccharide with a ketone group somewhere in the middle of that chain, right? The carbonyl is somewhere in the middle. So here's some visual representations of that. Um, our most simplest um, monosaccharide is going to be glyceroaldehyde. It is an aldotriose, right? So one, two, three carbons. Our carbonyl is at the end. That's why it is given the term aldotriose. It's commonly called glyceroaldehyde, but our IUPAC naming is going to be aldotriose. Um, Threose, right, has one, two, or threose, which is the common name, is also an aldotetrose, aldo for the aldehyde, tetro for four carbons, os for it being a sugar, ribose, is an aldopentose, one, two, three, four, five, and the aldehyde, where fructose is one of our ketone examples. It's a ketohexose, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. The carbonyl is coming off of a internal carbon, hence why it is a ketohexose. All right, so why don't we um, practice reviewing those concepts, identifying aldoses versus ketoses, identifying how many carbons are in the sugar by answering questions one through three on our in-class activity for carbohydrates. So log into Master in Chemistry and open that assignment and answer questions one through three. Pause here, and when you're ready, come back. All right, so... Before we start talking about carbohydrates, we need to talk about stereoisomers and chirality. So if you recall from some of our other chapters, um, stereoisomers um, 
are a specific type of structural isomer. So structural isomers are molecules that have the same molecular formula but different bonding arrangements. So the atoms might be sort of rearranged in a different or in, or in a different order. So for example, um, the molecular formula C2H6O, we can get either ethanol or dimethyl ether with the same molecular formula, right? So two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen can give us either one of these molecules. Same thing with C3H6O, we can get propanol or propanone. Now a stereo isomer is different. Here we are saying that the atoms are bonded in the same sequence, but they differ in their spatial arrangement. So here we can't make or break bonds um, in order to like have propanol, the C double bond O at the end versus propanone where the C double bond O is in the middle. Here in stereoisomers, what we are talking about is the difference between, say, cis or trans, right? So if you notice in trans 2-butene, right, these two carbons still have a methyl and a hydrogen bond to them in both the trans 2 and the cis 2. The only difference is the spatial orientation of those methyl groups off of the double bond. Here, right, they're an opposite face. Here, they're on the side face, right? They are two different molecules, but the bond arrangement or the bond order is the same. The only difference is the spatial arrangement. Now, these spatial arrangement differences can occur both on double bonds, in ring structures, um, and other ring structures, right? And we'll also see this happening when we have a special type of molecule called a chiral molecule. So chiral molecules are molecules um, in which the spatial arrangement of the atoms around the carbon cannot be superimposable. So what do I mean by superimposable? So an object whose mirror image is identical to the original and can be superimposed is considered achiral. So an example of that would be these two glasses, right? So if you look at these two glasses, they are perfectly mirror images of her that if you slide this glass over on top of this glass, you couldn't distinguish the difference. However, when you have a mirror image of two objects that are non-superimposable, then we call that chiral. So a great example of that is your hands, right? If you look at your hands and you mirror image of them in front of each other, they're mirror images, right? Your thumb lines up with your thumb. Like take your two hands, hold them up in front of your face with your palms facing each other, right? You'll notice that your thumbs are in the same position and all of your fingers are in the same position. Then if you turn your palms to your face, right, and then try to slide one hand in front of the other, notice that your thumbs are no longer superimposable, right? The only way to get them superimposable would be to flip one hand over so you're palm to palm, but now, right, that's, that's not the same thing as sliding on top of each other. Okay, that means that your molecule is chiral or your hands are chiral, right? A mirror image that is not superimposable. <clears throat> so again, we can look at that, right? The left and right hands are chiral because while they have a mirror image of each other, they cannot be superimposed on top of each other. When the mirror images cannot be completely matched, they are considered non superimposable and we say that it is chiral. So carbon atoms are chiral when they have four different atoms or groups bound to them. So for example, if we look at this molecule here, our carbons in the middle, we have a hydrogen, a chlorine, an iodine, and a bromine, right? We have one, two, three, four different substituents. If we look at them in the mirror, right, if we hold this molecule up to a mirror, we will get this image back. And then if we try to slide these two images over on top of each other, 
we will see that they are not superimposable. See, the chlorines are in different positions and the bromines are in different positions, right? In order for it to be superimposable, the bromines have to be lying on top of each other and the chlorines have to be lying on top of each other. If you try to rotate it so that that happens, then you're gonna end up flipping your hydrogens and your iodines, right? So we can't line up all of the atoms at the same time. So we, again, call the carbon atom chiral. So this carbon atom is considered chiral and the molecules, the two different molecules here, the two different mirror images are in antimers of each other. Okay? If a molecule with two or more identical atoms are bonded to the same atom, it can be rotated and superimposed then we call this carbon a chiral. So for example, if we swap out one of those substituents from our previous molecule, for example, the iodine to a bromine, right? Now we have the mirror image. If we simply rotate the mirror image, image counterclockwise one click, then we see that we can actually slide this molecule on top of this molecule and we get the same thing back. So what this means is that this mirror image is actually the same molecule just rotated. So if you can rotate it and superimpose it, then it is considered a chiral. And it's not a structural or stereoisomer, it is simply the same molecule just rotated. All right, so let's practice identifying chiral or achiral. Um, so the first thing you want to do is you're going to look at the carbon that you're being asked to make your assessment on. And remember, a chiral carbon is a carbon that has four different substituents on it. So not only do you want to look at what is directly bound to that carbon, but is there symmetry about that carbon atom, right? If I put a line straight down this glycerol molecule along this carbon, right, I want to see is there sort of symmetry about that carbon. So first off, I notice this carbon. I have a hydroxyl. I have this uh, COH on this side. I have a hydrogen and I have this COH on this side, right? CH2OH, CH2OH, hydroxyl and hydrogen. So this carbon has one, two, three. Now this functional group right here is the same thing as this functional group. So it only has three different substituents on the carbon, not four. There's symmetry about the axis here, right? This is the same as this side. Therefore, this is a chiral. Right, a chiral. We have three different substituents, not four. Now, this carbon here on the chain, if you notice, we're not in the middle, right? We're kind of off to the side. So, if I were to pull a line down this axis of this carbon, I can easily see that this functional group here is different, this substituent is different, and a hydrogen and an amino. So, we have one, two, three, four different substituents on this carbon, therefore this carbon is chiral, right? So A is achiral, we have one, two, three different substituents, where for MSG I have one, two, three, four different substituents, so MSG is considered chiral. All right, so why don't you practice um, that? What you're gonna do first on question four is you're gonna watch the video. Within the video, there's gonna be questions to help guide you, again, through visualizing chiral versus achiral. And then after the video, there's some additional questions in the right-hand pane of the screen that you wanna answer. So watch the video first. That's gonna help you answer the questions in the pane. All right. Um, for question 4a, it's just giving you the name of the compound. What's going to help you is to write out that structure. Um, those are going to be ketones. Um, so write out those structures and then ask yourself, are we chiral or not for the specific carbon that it's asking you for? All right. Again, feel free to work with a partner. Um, pause and come back when you're ready. Okay. 
So one thing that kind of helps us visualize chiral carbons is something called the Fischer projection. So remember, carbon atoms are tetrahedral, meaning the carbon is kind of at the center of a pyramid where each point of the pyramid is a substituent. Um, and if we were to sort of tilt a pyramid over to its side, we could see um, that we have two substituents coming out at us um, at a V and two substituents going out behind us at a V. Okay, so kind of think of like a person where you can, you know, straddle your legs and then have your arms going perpendicular to your legs in V motions above your head and your legs down. That's what you can kind of visualize, right? So these are sort of your arms coming up and out at a V and then your legs going down perpendicular to your arms um, at a V. All right, that's sort of the visualization of the Fisher projection. And I'll show you this the next time we're in class with our model kits if it's hard to visualize. Um, but often, yes, so in a Fisher projection, your chiral carbon is drawn at the center um, with horizontal lines for bonds that project forward and, ver and then vertical lines. So horizontal lines, these are projecting forward, these are projecting toward us out of the screen with vertical lines are projecting out behind the screen. Okay. <clears throat> um, so that is sort of the three dimensional structure um, in the dash wedge. Now with the Fisher projected, we don't have to do the wedges and the dashes. We just know that if on the vertical axis our substituents are going behind the screen and on the horizontal axis our substituents are coming toward us in the screen. Okay, And then we can draw um, our molecules this way. Okay, So that is our Fisher projection. <clears throat> Now, Fisher projections can also be drawn for compounds that have more than one carbon, chiral carbon. And in sugars, we have many chiral carbons. Almost all the carbons, except for the terminal alcohol and the aldehyde and ketone, are going to be considered chiral. Um, the mirror, and, and so for example, um, we can look at um, the mirror image of L-urethros is drawn by reversing the position of all of the H and OH groups, right? So let me back up. When we identify chirality, we identify the chirocarbon as either D or L. And what this has to go to is, is chirocarbons have a property of rotating what we call plane polarized light um, in a certain instrument. Um, and so if it rotates it in one direction, we call it D. If it rotates it in the opposite direction, we call it L. Um, so when we identify carbohydrates as either D or L, what we are talking about is the orientation of the hydroxyl compared to the carbonyl at that second to last carbon. Okay, so for example, if the hydroxyl is pointing um, towards the right hand side on this last carbon, we call it D. If it's pointing to the left hand side, we call it L. Now, when we're talking about Fisher projections for D versus L, notice not only um, do we change the orientation of the hydroxyl group for that one carbon, but we change it to the opposite side for all of the other carbons moving up the chain. Okay, So for D-glucose, we have our hydroxyls in this specific orientation, so it's D, D, L, D. In L-glucose, it's L, L, D, L. But again, we are just going to name the overall sugar based on the second to last carbon from the aldose or the ketose, okay? <clears throat> so again, just to review, the designation as a D or an L stereoisomer of the Fisher projection is determined by the pos position 
of the hydroxyl group attached to the chiral carbon farthest from the carbonyl. So farthest away from the carbonyl, the last chiral carbon farthest. The reason this carbon isn't identified is because it's not chiral. Notice we have two hydrogens and a hydroxyl and then this substituent. Because we have two hydrogens, we know this guy's not chiral because we have two substituents that are the same. So it's the next carbon up that is considered our chiral carbon. If the hydroxyl is coming to the left of the Fischer projection, it's an L, right? Left L, left L. If it's coming towards the right um, in the Fischer projection, then it is D, okay? The D isoform. <clears throat> now, what's the point of this? Well, we can actually get very different properties from the L isomer versus the D isomer. Um, so for example, when we think of carvone, right? Carvone is this molecule here. We have a chiral carbon here at the bottom of the ring. Um, in L carvone, where this functional group is coming off towards the left on our Fischer projection, this is the aromatic or the molecule that you can smell and taste in spearmint versus D-carvone, which is the molecule that you kind of taste in caraway or also known as sort of fennel, right? Two very, very, very different flavor and scent profiles, all derived from just the difference in the stereoisomer of the L versus the D. And this has to do with the fact that when we taste these compounds, what we are actually doing is having a chemical reaction on our tongue receptors. And our tongue receptors are going to be specific for one molecule versus the other. So the tongue receptors that taste spearmint is gonna relay a different signal than the tongue receptors that bind to and taste um, caraway, right? So Again, we're going to elicit a different nerve response to the different molecules because we can, at our receptor level, determine the difference between these two isomers. All right, so let's practice this. Indicate whether each of the following pairs of the Fischer projection cannot be superimposed. So again, is this a chiral carbon here in the center, yes or no? So for A, Look, we have one, two, three, four substituents. One, two, three, four substituents, right? Here, what we are swapping is the methyl group. This is not superimposable. Therefore, it will be chiral, right? So they cannot be superimposed. These Fischer projections here, we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, but two of them are the same, right? If we are to rotate this molecule, um, one, two, three, four, right? We can rotate this guy, right? All we have to do is rotate us 180 degrees and we end up getting the same molecule back and we can superimpose, right? So if we rotate on this axis 180 degrees, basically swapping out these two, it is superimposable. We can't do that here, right? If we rotate 180 degrees, um, then it is not going to be superimposable. Okay? Cannot be superimposed, can be superimposed. All right? So let's identify this sugar as either D or L. So remember, we want to look at the farthest chiral carbon away from the carbonyl. So here's our carbonyl, CHO, okay? This is a chiral carbon, 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 this is not a chiral carbon. We have two substituents that are the same, right? So this is our chiral carbon furthest away. And remember, we identify it as D or L based on the hydroxyl. If the hydroxyl is pointing to the right or to the 3 o'clock position, then we call it D. If it's pointing to the left or to the 6 o'clock position, then we call it L. Because this hydroxyl is pointing to the right or towards the 3 o'clock position, we would identify this as a D sugar.
Okay, so the hydroxyl is to the right. It is a D in the end tumor. Now, let's talk about some important monosaccharides um, and recognize that in our bodies, we mostly only make and utilize D isomers of our sugars. Now, a lot of bacteria can use L. Um, and that actually poses a problem for antibacterial resistance, especially when those L sugars are used to make protective barriers to encase the bacterial cells or the viral cells. Um, and our defense mechanisms can't come in and break those down because our enzymes cannot break down the L isomers. We have evolved to use the D isomers. So some really important monosaccharides is D-glucose, right? D that hydroxyl is in the D position, D-galactose, and D-fructose, okay? Notice these are all um, have the molecular formula C6H12O6, so they are all isomers of each other. Two of them are aldoses, so they are all stereoisomers of each other. D-fructose is a ketose, so it's actually a structural isomer. So these are stereoisomers, this one is a structural isomer because the carbonyl is in a different position compared to glucose and galactose. <clears throat> All right, glucose um, is the main sugar found in fruits and vegetables, corn syrup and honey, um, also commonly called dextrose in our blood sugar. It's the building block of many disaccharides and polysaccharides such as cellulose and glycogen. Galactose um, is the one of the main sugars found in lactose or milk sugar, um, and it's really important in cellular membrane of in cellular membranes of the brain and nervous system. So if you have clients who cannot break down lactose, um, you need to make sure that they are getting supplemental galactose. Um, and then there are some clients or patients that have metabolic disorders where they can't use galactose and that's going to cause a lot of issues in brain and nervous system development from infancy. Um, fructose is um, the one main ketohexose that we utilize in our body. Um, it's the sweetest of the carbohydrates, often twice as sweet um, as sucrose, um, and it's often obtained from sucrose, right? So fructose and glucose is the disaccharide in sucrose. We also see it enriched in high fructose corn syrup, and there's issues with that. Our body does not metabolize fructose. Um, the same way as it metabolized glucose. So if you end up with a diet that's high in fructose, you can have uncontrolled weight gain um, because we have less regulation of the way we break down fructose um, than we do glucose. And we, again, that's something you're gonna explore more when you talk about metabolism in future classes um, or at the end of this uh, semester if we can get there. All right, so let's um, now go to number five in our in-class activity. Again, we have another interactive video that's going to help us understand Fisher projections and D versus L in a more visual way um, than I can do in this lecture, and then answer the questions after watching the video. Pause, and when you're ready, come back. All right, so that's going to wrap us up for part one. Um, we will pick up in our next lecture video with part two, cyclic carbohydrates and the glycidic bond. Here we're going to pick up with talking about Hawthorne, 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 Haworth structures of monosaccharides, um, talk about the different reactions that monosaccharides can undergo, and then talk about how we link monosaccharides together and disaccharides through the glycosidic bond and then also polymers of carbohydrates and amulus, amulopectin, glycogen, and cellulose. All right, so I will see you back here for part two. Thanks, and I hope you guys have a great day.